So perhaps to kickstart us off, to draw from that exercise, to say that one of the biggest challenges that we face is that progressive activism has made a very big error historically in terms of thinking of how we communicate and how we shape narratives and how we actually reach the largest number of people so that we respond with the urgency that the situation calls for. And I want to say that I'm going to upset a few people and bring a rather uncomfortable name into the room to say that we might be able to learn something from Steve Bannon. So what we notice is that most of our activism in the climate movement, for example, is very focused on facts and figures and scientific arguments. You know, 350 parts per million, 1.5 degrees and so on. Most of the time that is flying over people's heads. Whereas the Steve Bannons of the world ignore the head and facts and figures. They deliberately use lies, and I'm not advocating for the use of lies. But what they do is they understand better than progressives do the power of the heart and the power of emotions, the power of passion, and all of those things. So today, as we gather here today, we have to recognize that we sit in one of the most consequential decades in humanity's history. And I want to quote an anti-colonial leader, Amilka Cabral, from Guinea-Bissau, when he said, freedom fighters and those seeking justice should never tell lies and claim easy victories. So as we gather here today, that's the spirit of our conversation. Let us not uh, delude ourselves about how close to winning the struggle for climate justice we are, because in fact, we are very far away, right? So the conversation is drawing inspiration from Albert Einstein, who once said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. And at this point, I want to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to do the same. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. Okay, open your eyes now. And how many of you in this room meet that definition of insanity? In good faith, maybe. It's not to mean we're bad people, right? But many of us are stuck in ways of being. And essentially, this conversation is about saying, if you're saying to business and government, it cannot be business as usual, and it cannot be government as usual, we have to be saying to ourselves as well, it cannot be activism as usual. And we have to be understanding how we evoke the power of arts and culture to be able to reach the large enough numbers of people that we need to. Now, in framing this, I want to say one sort of pessimistic thing and one optimistic thing right, from my observation. So on the pessimistic side, I don't remember any moment in the last 45 years that we have had such a massive set of challenges that come together in a boiling point and in a concentrated way. That's the negative side. The positive side, I don't believe any moment in history that I've seen in my 45 years of activism where there is such an appetite for deep structural and systemic change. There's never been a mo moment where people are saying, listen, it's no longer a question of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while humanity sinks and incremental tinkering here and there. I'm not saying that's a majority of people in the world, no. But I'm saying that we have a situation where we now have a critical mass much bigger than we ever had, or saying we cannot go on treating the symptoms of the problem, we have to address the root causes. So it's within that context of framing the conversation, and I hope this works, we have uh, three questions that we want to put up for you to answer. But uh, we have the question that can go up on the screen. So there are three options. Even if it doesn't go, I'm going to wing it uh, if the technology lets us down. So I'm going to give you three options about where we are in terms of the climate struggle to give you a chance to make a very important judgment right at the beginning of the conversation. There are option one, two, and three. Option one. And for option one, you will go to the corner there when I ask you to go. 
if you believe that essentially the climate struggle is within control, that actually it's, we're largely on track and we are doing okay. That's option one. Option two is if you think actually we're in deep, deep crisis, but actually somehow the forces of sanity will prevail and will make the changes and will get there even though the window of opportunity is closing. And option two goes on this half, at that corner, okay? And then option three goes here in this corner. If you think that, okay, can I can say it in so many different ways, <laughs> but uh, all adults, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you think that the option three is eloquently called by some people, we are fucked option. Okay, that it's too late, that we are damned, and so on, right? That's option three. Everybody got the three options? Okay, so we don't have it on the screen, but that's fine. Uh, so I want you to go there in, I'll say, five, four, three, two, one. I want you to go there and just start chatting with the people in your group for five minutes, okay? And by the way, all three answers are correct, so don't feel shy about choosing whichever answer you want, okay? Right, just what you're feeling in your heart, right? Forget the factual stuff a little bit if you can for the session, just what you're feeling in your heart. We've just had a most amazing woman from Africa whose name happens to be Hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> whose, whose country has been through a historical process that none of us can even, or few of us, can even begin to imagine, right? But what you saw was a way of being and thinking about how you keep optimism, spirit, passion, uh, purpose alive. So thank you again, Hope. And then I would say that this moment of history that we find ourselves in is one way we can say pessimism is a luxury we simply cannot afford, yeah. right? We simply cannot afford, right? And then we have to say to ourselves that the pessimism of our analysis, like my group there, number three group, right? The pessimism, our analysis has every reason to drive you to, uh, to, to pessimism. But the pessimism of our analysis is best overcome by the optimism of our actions, our creativity, and our interventions. And that's what we hope today's conversation will be about. And that's what we hope will inspire additionality to what activism is all about. So with those opening comments, I would like to invite Molly Fannin, the head of UN Live, which is a unique institution, which is accredited by the United Nations, but operates completely independently. And even though it's, it's known as a museum of the United Nations, it's not anything close to a conventional museum. It's about taking arts and culture to the people and wherever the people live is where museums are. Mm -hmm. right? The art of living is about creating spaces where people can be and so on. And uh, Molly has played many, many roles. I'm not going to run through all, the, all of them from in Washington, in Argentina, and she's a truly global citizen. And she would like to always remind me, though, that the thing that she's most passionate about is a three wonderful daughters. So over to you, over to you, Molly. Thank you, Kumi. Um, I was actually going to begin with my three wonderful daughters because we had a conversation. Mega, is that your name? Um, so Hope is the name of my first daughter. When she was born, she's Catherine because that's my grandmother, Catherine Hope. And when she was born, I was 32, so I should have known it by then, but I realized that I was someday going to die. And it was the middle of the night and I was holding her in my arms and I thought there will come a time when she's on this planet and I'm not here to protect her. And that was the night I first signed up to become a climate advocate. Um, I joined a climate parents organization in the United States. My second daughter, Anna, Hope, I will tell you, we, we now live in Denmark where it's cold all the time. She, you can get Anna to do anything if you offer her ice cream. And one of her first realizations of why she liked Denmark was that ice cream never melts. So I would encourage you to always eat ice cream in the winter time. And then we were talking about, um, Meg and I were talking about the name she's thinking about for her unborn boy. 
Um, it's a boy, for those of you who are wondering. Um, <laughs> and she's looking at names that mean courage. And I told her that when I had my third, at the time I didn't know, but daughter, um, I was looking for names that mean resilience. And there aren't any female names that mean resilience. So I named her after my great-grandmother, um, who came from Ireland at the time when she was 16 and worked her way up as a maid in New York City to then have a family in the United States, um, Lizzie. So I don't always begin my public speech speeches talking about my three daughters, but there you go, Catherine Hope, Anna, who likes ice cream in winter, and, and Lizzie, who is about resilience. Um, and I do believe that a lot of the science and um, what drives me in my everyday life is the realization that my head is in this corner. <laughs> But my future and my children and everybody else's children and the children of those children need us to all be over there in that corner. There were a few people over in this corner too, Werner. We sent you there. We didn't expect many people there, so I would love I to someday sent. hear. I was illegally sent, but we had two. <laughs> So I, um, I love Kumi because he's irreverent and he speaks truth. And I, um, I, I think I, I hold those two things in common with you a bit. I actually... I do not think we're fucked because I think if we're brave enough to acknowledge that what we've been doing for the last 30 plus years has not worked at all and it's time for a complete reimagination of what it's going to take to solve this huge problem, if we're brave enough to say those words and then to take action with what happens, um, with what needs to happen, I do think we can move over into this corner, but only if we're brave enough, right? Because when the last IPCC report came out, there were some spikes in the searches for climate change, right? But they didn't even come close to searches for Crocs or Family Guy, right? So climate change does not communicate itself. We've been leaving the science of communication around climate change to scientists, and I worked with a lot of them when I was at the Smithsonian Institution, and I love them to death, but they're not naturally born communicators, most of them, right? And then behavioral scientists will say to you that even the most well-intentioned behavioral change campaigns that we are so familiar with, they kind of work sometimes at best, right? So we need a radical reshifting about how we're gonna engage people and get a lot of people to become activists in their own lives. And I really admire a woman, if you haven't heard of her, I please look her up and watch her TED talk, Catherine Hayhoe, she's the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy. She just wrote a book called Saving Us, and she's also a Christ an evangelical Christian from Canada living in Texas. It's a tricky place to be in the United States where I'm from an evangelical Christian scientist living in Texas who states that every single person in the world is a climate advocate, ad activist. They just don't realize it yet because we don't talk to them in ways that they can respond, right? And we were talking about that living in Colorado and what it's like to watch the wildfires come through all the time and have the, the most scientists around you and yet not have it be part of our daily vernacular. How do we get climate change into the daily vernacular? What I'm here to say is there is a secret tool, we just haven't deployed it yet, and it's, I, my chief strategy officer likes to remind me that it's actually not radical. So culture here, I'm gonna ask you guys a few questions I want you to be really, really honest. There are some people here who I think are gonna respond in certain ways based on my prejudiced ways of, of, of looking at you. How many thought that um, coming to an arts conference or an arts discussion was a bit weird for a, for a world um, forum, like School World Forum, or it didn't really matter? Come on, be honest. Every, okay, so we're really preaching to the choir here. All right, so that's part of the problem. Um, how many of you have, now I want you to be honest, how many of you have secretly, even if it's at night, no one knows you're doing it on your phone, binge watched a TV show in the last, I'll give you six months? Be honest. Okay, put your hands out. Who didn't binge watch a TV show? Were you listening to good music on Spotify? No. Did you read books? Yeah, okay, all right. So the reality is that um, people, most people do binge watch television shows. Um, a lot of people listen to music. And the reality is that that is actually the single fastest way to change societies. And it's not something new. Right? So I have been studying the effects of culture, and particularly mass culture, on how co societies can reimagine themselves in the future and decide who belongs and who doesn't. That was my academic background um, for a long time. And I remember beginning looking at romance novels in the 1800s in Latin America. So in these newly minted independent countries in Latin America, 
what was the predominant form of mass culture? It was, it was a, the novel, the printed book, right? And romance novels were used in Latin America in the, early, in the 1800s to do, for nefarious purposes, probably more so than good purposes, to decide who belonged in these countries. What were the roles of women? Could you have a mestizaje or like mixed race um, couples? Was that okay in societies? So they used the popular culture, people used popular culture to engender a sense of imagination about what kind of nation are we building? We created imagination through pop culture. Martin Luther King was, was the quote, I'm not gonna get it exactly right, but he was like, the crisis needs the drama, right? So in 1962, 90% of, telev of American families had televisions in the United States. In 1946, the year my mom was born, that was only 1%. So the, the, the social media driver in 1962 was the television. The civil rights movement, it's been analyzed. There's a fantastic article in the Atlantic that you can read about this would not have come to pass in the same way were it not for the television taking up and bringing into people's homes the civil rights movement, which had a, a double-faced coin, right? There were, there were different narratives that were being put forward about what black Americans could or should be and what civil rights could be and who could bestow those rights upon others. I'm being, I'm being quite pointed in my, in my remarks. Um, culture changes societies. A few years ago, I was in an amazing lecture with a woman named Mazarin Banaji. She coined the term implicit bias. I don't know who of you remembers when Trump and Hillary got in an argument over what implicit bias means. Implicit bias means those thoughts that we all have as human beings because we're human that are hidden so deeply within our brains that we are not even aware we hold them, right? So I would say I'm a CEO and I'm a woman that I believe women can be professionals, but I failed every single test, right, about women being able to be professionals. So I hold a deep, deeply rooted implicit bias against myself. That's true for all of us in this room. Mazarin Banaji has been studying implicit bias in the United States for a very long time using functional MRIs, so you can't trick her, right? You can't, she's watching your brain when you're answering questions, you can't trick her. And she's studying it across many different forms of, of bias. So age, gender, race, um, body type, sexuality, et cetera. And in the vast majority of those biases, with gender and with race, there's been a 25% shift in a reduction of implicit bias from 2007 to 2020. So the predictions of when it will disappear is about 130, 150 years ago for, uh, from now. So that's the we're fucked corner. For everything else, like body type and, um, and age and other thing else, it's, it's even, you're even more fucked. Like there's no, there's no change. But for sexuality, there was a 64% reduction in implicit bias in that same exact time period from 2007 to 2020. And it's now projected that implicit bias in the United States for, for sexuality will be non-existent in the next 25 years across the United States. And that is true across every single marker of difference. So it doesn't matter which political, where you are on the political spectrum, how old you are, what race you come from, it's, it's the same trend line for across the entire United States. So you ask her, well, what happened? What happened to make sexuality, to implicit bias on sexuality will disappear by the time my children are in their 30s? Hollywood and love. So she now says it's because Hollywood took up the cause of sexuality, probably because there were more people that were, um, that were different in Hollywood, and they made the, the cool actors be gay. The gay people in the, sh in the shows and the movies and Will and & Grace and Ellen DeGeneres were the cool ones that you wanted to be friends with. This is her analysis right now, right? They changed the social norms. They allowed us to imagine gay and, and different forms of sexuality to be part of, part of our society. And then the second part of her answer is love. If you change the social norm and you can imagine who belongs, then if there's someone in your family who's part of that social class and you love them, then it creates cognitive dissonance if you're not willing to then change your behavior and what you deem acceptable in life. You can't say this is not acceptable and I love you. You can't hold those same two thoughts in your head at the same time. So her analysis says that if you really want to do, if you want to see that kind of change, and in my opinion, climate change is not different than our implicit biases with race or gender. It's our bias, our bias as to whether or not we're fucked or whether it's not, we're still worth, it's worth acting, right? Are we going to become apathetic and give up? Or are we going to stay optimistic even with the facts, as Kumi says, because we know um, 
we know we have no other option because it really is a question of survival as a species. So her studies using functional MRI machines are showing that it is possible to fast track massive social change and actually rewire human brains across societies. And her analysis points to the fact that it's mass culture that did that. And I'm looking at one of my colleagues, Jess Hines, with whom we're now working in Bollywood to do that kind of work using climate as the topic. So the power of culture is not some fuzzy thing that it, that's nice to have, it's window dressing around the serious topics. It actually is probably the number one best and fastest way to get a lot of people to reimagine future scenarios and then change their ways of thinking about things. It's been measured in a lot of other places. We work very closely with MIT, with the um, Poverty Action Lab, if you've heard about it, which is kind of the gold standard for social impact investment. There they've studied initiatives, for example, in Peru, there was um, a Princeton University professor and a Chilean um, university professor, who, both economists, who studied what is the single best intervention to get kids to stay in school longer? Where do we get the most return on our investment in, in terms of development aid to get kids to stay in school longer? It was the soap opera industry. By putting a soap opera about staying in school longer, they were able to drive over a four-year period a 20% reduction in, or 20% increase in boys staying in school longer and a 15% reduction in the, in the group that was studied of young girls who were no longer um, child laborers in, in, in urban areas in Peru with the telenovela sector in Latin America. That doesn't surprise me having worked all across Latin America. In Nigeria, MTV Sugar did a huge push around television programs um, around HIV. And that was studied by MIT and the World Bank, both economists that studied that um, TV show around HIV, 50% or twice, like, twice as likely to get tested for HIV if you had been watching the show, and a 55% reduction in sexually transmitted infections among women who watched the show, which means they were changing their behavior based on that show. What was really important about that science, about the investigation, was that the more hooked you were, so raise your hand if you were binge watching, because that means you're hooked, right? You, you hit the button before it goes all the way to white and it starts over. I'll admit it, I do it, right? The more hooked you are in the narrative, the greater your increase in change of your behavior and in the way you act in the world. It's the same in, in Rwanda, actually, in societies where people are not really as, studies have been, I, I was, we were talking about Rwanda and Mozambique and Bosnia in our group, actually. Um, and, and my experience of, of when you work in countries that have hit such terrible places of rock bottom that you often meet some of the most optimistic people that I've ever met in my life. In societies that those things can happen are often societies where it's really hard to speak out against the, 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 the main kind of uh, current of what's acceptable. So there was a radio program in Rwanda that was done and that was studied, um, by, studied by, by scientists at Yale predominantly it was like a Romeo and Juliet radio program with one Hutu and one Tutsi falling in love. And what they were able to prove, statistically speaking, is that you were it didn't change the way that people behaved generally in society. But what it did change, which actually is a hugely important thing, is people's willingness to say what was to go against authority and to speak out loud disagreement which we need to have in society. Also, people who, who were into that radio show and were really hooked were far more likely to begin to work um, in the service of refugees, of people from the, other, from the other group that they were not from. So culture changes things. That's why in 2015, ISIS bombed Palmyra. They wouldn't have bombed Palmyra if they didn't realize the first thing you want to do to bring a society to its knees is erase its history erase its memory so that new people can write a new history and new and a new memory. And those people, as Milan Hubal wrote, will quickly forget who they were and the world will forget even faster. Culture is powerful. It's used by Steve Bannon. It's used by ISIS. People don't realize that they bombed it after they looted it. And actually the looting fueled the funding of ISIS second only to revenues in gas. So culture is tremendously powerful. But it is completely powerful in its ability to hook us with our hearts and to actually rewire our brains as individuals and as societies. It's been proven now by behavioral change scientists. Now what we need to do is we need to actually work in Hollywood, in Nollywood, in Bollywood, with the music industry to make sure that we leverage the 
tremendous communications power of mass culture that has been proven time and time again by behavioral scientists and by economists at scale and with a sense of urgency. And that's what we're working on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Molly. Let's hear it for Molly. So by the way, I did not, yeah, I did not forget that each of the groups were going to give us the reflections. You're going to give us your reflections on why you chose to go to one to three at the end of these comments, because I'm hoping there might be some slight shifts in how you're seeing things. But just quickly, what your contribution evoked in me were a few things. One is during the struggle against apartheid, where the, for example, the, the SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, was popularly known in activist circles as the South African Brainwashing Corporation. Mm. And we really, really struggled to get our message across to large numbers of people because the state apparatus was so, so, the ideological state apparatus was actually, in most cases, I would argue, a bigger challenge than the repressive state apparatus. Oftentimes we think that governments control us mainly by the deployment of army, police, formal laws, and so on. I want to suggest what the way Molly presents it. She's encouraging us to actually think that actually maybe the more insidious, more pervasive form of control is not the obvious repressive means, but it's the framing of education, the framing of uh, funding of arts and culture, our education system, and particularly how media and communications are regulated. Yeah. And, I, and we learned during the transition to away from apartheid this term of edutainment mm -hmm. and infotainment. That would said that the best way to reach people is to meet people where they are. Yep. Right? And people everywhere need to watch, binge watch something, right, in today's world, right? And so, so how do you design things that are both entertaining and keep people's attention, but do it in a way that has an educational component, an information component, and so on? So that's one reflection. The other reflection was, you know, Martin Luther King. When you're just, because Martin Luther King speaking in 1965 offered us a really powerful wisdom which the world has ignored. He said, my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to note in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Mm -hmm. Now, all of us want to be well-adjusted and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to be well-adjusted to. By the way, this is not me at all. This is all Martin Luther King. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then he goes on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to racial discrimination. And on the economy, he says, I never intend to un adjust to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. Mm -hmm. So if that was true for the United States in 1965, when I was four months old, when he gave the speech, uh, it is much more relevant in the U.S. today as it is around the world. In a longer version of the speech, right, which is really the message of this workshop, as I was hearing you, I was thinking this is what Martin Luther King meant. When in a longer version of the speech, he said, I now call upon decent men and women to come together to set up a new international organization to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Now, unfortunately, so unfortunately, this, this, this organization was never formed. But There's I, still time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's not so important. Actually, to be honest, we don't need to form an organization. We need to make sure that we feel comfortable about saying we are creatively maladjusted, yeah. which basically says we're not prepared to accept a broken status quo and we have to mobilize you know, in different ways. So thank you very much, Molly. You're welcome. And we're now going to go to our good friend, Werner. So Werner is a very interesting creature. <laughs> <laughs> you went to that corner. <laughs> firstly, 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 he's an optimist, to be honest. He was deployed to that, <laughs> <laughs> to that corner. But Werner is a dancer, which is the most important thing to know about him, right? And that is something he did professionally and so on. 
but he occupied a very lonely place. The, by the way, this is not the introduction he wanted to give me to give. I'm giving my own introduction here. But he occupied a very lonely place in the world generally, but specifically in the philanthropic world, of saying philanthropy needs to support arts and culture much more seriously for a long time. He was a bit of a lonely voice uh, and, and has headed up something called the Community Arts Lab within Porticus Foundation and has played a big role in setting up the Community Arts Network, which he chairs. And so he has traveled a long journey and I think he is one of the most excited people around at the moment in the world because suddenly he says, Ish, at least I have a few more friends joining me at the moment. So with that introduction, Please put your hands together to welcome Werner. Thank you, Kumi. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm here, I, I see, as you said, maybe a little bit among friends, and that's, and that's also good. We need our rooms also to, to support each other, especially in these, these times. And maybe, and maybe that's a, a little bit my starting point, of, co of course, because of the, we just have discussed it because of the pace and because of the urgency, the climate issue is so much uh, up front and in front of all of us. But of course, we, we, we have challenges moreover. And, and you mentioned many, you mentioned, or at the beginning, there were some mentioned, and they're all interlinked. So it's not just a climate thing. It is way more, as we know. And, um, and maybe I bring us a little bit back in, in my few remarks, like to this beautiful center here. It's an artistic center, so we are lucky to be here. And for me, these kind of places, these kind of uh, spaces where, where people can meet each other and have just learned me with lived experience or performing here, they're part of this. These are places of hope. We are just talking. These are places of creation. These are places of reimagination. And these are all beautiful ingredients of, let's say, artistic processes. And and let me start, so I'm focusing a little bit more on, on the arts. Of course, obviously, we have to be also carefully. Now, now, sometimes, although I love our friends talking about how culture and arts can support in social challenge, but, but I felt, because I've worked a, a long time in my life in, in, in the social realm, social work, and a lot with migrants or people with lived experience, homeless people, like also people who are involved here, and... And it was at that time that it was, you know, we all made the mess, whole society made the mess. And then in a way, in the aftermath of making the mess and the carnival on the street, the social workers are coming for little salary and cleaning our streets, you know, and we are delegating those things deliberately to, to people earning not a lot of money. And now sometimes, although I'm super biased and I'm a super fan of arts and culture, I feel like now we're getting there, so now it's the artists and very often the poor artists who are now cleaning our communities and neighborhoods with the people. I just want to value that this also happens and we have to be careful that arts, and it has been instrumentalized and abused historically, which is, by the way, one of the very good arguments why arts is very powerful. Why is it the first thing which is cut out? Think of Trump's um, Trump's government, it, I think it was the first thing which he cut out was the endowment for the arts. Why? Why is it that in Hungary uh, they nationalized the, big, uh, the bigger, larger arts institutions? First thing. Second thing, they cut the grassroots arts movement. Why? Because they knew historically art has always been the best partner, steering, uh, creator of revolutions and evolutions, and it was always part. And it was interesting for me to step into a world after being in the field of arts and after uh, starting community arts initiatives, to step in a world where, you know, I felt I was the sideline, exactly. You know, when we, when we were talking with our, for instance, education colleagues, you know, art was not mentioned. They talked about whole child development, social emotional learning, and all these super facts, and I felt like, and where is the arts? Do you find any, any philosopher who will talk about education and not talk about the arts? We just cut it out. We made it a luxury. And it's true, we made it a luxury for the few. And this is insane, like this is more generally where we were fighting within our, also our organization. This is not only true in the field of education, it's true in many other fields when it comes to injustices. We know that what you said, I think we still face 
And I think it's still true. The three biggest wounds are we are in a social crisis. We are not connected to each other. We are in a climate crisis. We are not connected to environment. But it's not just the environment, planet Earth. We are even not connected to the neighbors. We are flying into Oxford when you don't know who are the neighbors, who is living around here. We have no idea. We're just coming in. And the third thing, and I think this is even the worst, we are not connected to ourselves. And that's, that's, I think, the biggest portion. We are not healed ourselves. Sometimes I feel we are mirroring, actually, inside ourselves what happens outside in the world. So we are mirroring that mess. Oh, Ed Card is coming. Great. <laughs> Big applause. And, 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 and the biggest problem, I think, I guess, also in the climate realm and also in, in foundations, things are so fragmented. We work on education. We work on climate change. We work on, and it's not interlinked. The good thing is, the good news is art is cross-cutting. It's this basic human language which can connect to ourselves, which can, I think it's the best connector. Mm. If you think about what other means, what other instrument, is a beautiful connector beyond words. And as we are so headed, also in foundations, by the way, and I feel like the same experts sitting in the same horizontal tables, having a super sophisticated, actually also building again the wall against the others, because we are the ones who know. That's a tricky thing. And even when I worked in the social work, I felt we were building the wall too, because we were saying we are the good ones implicitly saying the others are the bad ones. So we need bridge builders <laughs> deliberately in all these, uh, in all these topics. And, and that's why I believe so much in the arts. I think it's the best connector. But it's also about reimagination. Very often I face also in many, and it's, it's a bit unfair. You always, you always find different people who are really moved. But if we are not moved, how can we move? If you are not passionate, how can we passion? What is, what is, and I think there is the offer also to all of us working in that realm. If we cannot have joy, <laughs> if we, and joy is, by the way, the most important uh, by um, Verena Kast. She's an amazing psychotherapist. She's a grand dame in that field. And she says, joy is the most important ingredient or emotion for solidarity. So if you want to have solidarity, come up with joyful programs. That doesn't mean service joy. That means deep joy. It means something like Hope did at the beginning with us connecting. And so much also in the field of philanthropy, it's all about transactional. We are, we are changing business cards. Even in this big conference, business cards, business cards. I'm the director of things. What are you doing? We will, I don't believe that we change anything if we are not connected human to human. Subject to subject. That's a deeper connection. And that's why we are, we are, we are often using the analogy of a choir, of a dance uh, ensemble, where you connect in all your vulnerability, where you connect deeply, automatically. You don't have to talk about it. And, and there, arts can come in also to seed hope. And I, you know, when we were discussing it, how can we, and, and it's not, I, I could talk a lot about the initiatives we started, we're working with partners, for instance, uh, with the Truth Commission in Colombia in the aftermath of, of the peace treaty. And they now finally said arts was, these arts programs were the best connector. They were the only ones who were capable to bring those different unlikely allies, if you want so, together, beyond words. It's not the words. It's not information which works. We know this. Sci neuroscientists is so clear, experience is more important than information. Now, 98% of education is information. Even in climate, in the climate realm, the campaigns, it was mainly information. Even we as foundation, we work with reports. You inform us at the end of the grant with, I don't know, 20 pages, nobody reads. It's a bit unfair, I try to read them. But basically, it's not convincing also funders and even my board, you know, it was interesting to convince them that they set up uh, our, our arts unit, which was, of course, definitely like, why do we need this? It's a bit of a luxury. If we have some time and money left in the afternoon programs, then maybe we could invest. But the funny thing is, of course, they immediately would say, 
we need reports, we need evaluations, we need impact measurement tools and things like that. And I'm not against it. I mean, not at all. Don't, don't. But I think the evidence is not only reports, it's storytelling. It's something else. And in my view, it's experience. And that's the beauty analogy to the arts. Arts is per se experience. In an artistic process, you experience something. And we all know it goes way deeper than somebody can inform you and then you just forget. And, and the board member who was the most critical in my board, he didn't get, con of, of course he said, where is the report? Show me because I can't believe and I don't believe. At the end of the day, we just took him to an arts experience, to a program where kids were singing every day. And then that moment, it's gone. he's the, mo the biggest supporter. So um, what I'm saying, because of the pace, we need this culture shift. And we need, I think, mass culture. I would say popular culture, we say that very often. But we also need this very arts moment, artistic moment for all of us to, I think, to heal ourselves, to help have hope for ourselves to start here. And I feel I've worked in the field of migration and with people lived experience 20 years, and we were exhausted. Exhausted, sorry. We were exhausted. Well, probably we were exhausted oh, yes, too. too. Both, both. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But, you know, what are we doing for ourselves to have and gain, again, perspective and hope? And maybe I end there that I believe art is maybe, beside to be the best connector, it is the best hope giver and, and giving perspective. And I believe in it that there is always the possibility of hope. And that's why I'm hanging on. That's what my choreographer, when I worked with him, said every day in the rehearsals, there is always the possibility of hope. And I never forget that. So thanks for joining this and, and being with us. Yeah, and we can enjoy something at the end with this guy over there. Thank you very, very, very much, Werner. <laughs> Edgar, come and join us. Welcome, my brother. So, um, I just want to quickly give a couple of reflections on what uh, Werner said. Uh, so, it reminds me of a moment during the liberation struggle in South Africa where some of the older leaders would say, Let's say if an athlete, uh, sorry, a musician uh, did a love song, right? You know, just nothing to do with the struggle against apartheid or you'd have a couple of older leaders say, hey, why are you wasting your time with bloody love songs? Uh, you must use your skills for the service of the struggle, right? So I want to be very clear that that is not the kind of environment we are talking about. We actually want, we need actually the worlds of arts and culture to hold up a mirror to activism as much as holding up a mirror to society as at all. Because we have deluded ourselves that we are much greater in impact than we actually are. Right? Let's just be very clear. Just be very, very clear that we are at 1.2 degrees. right? And the science says we need to be under 1.5 degrees. Right now, as we sit in this room, there is no possibility, really, uh, for us to get there. So what we need is a scale of participation and mobilization never seen before in the world. And that is why we need to harness the full power of arts and culture to be able to do this. And let me just say that when I say we are part of the problem, this moment does call for rigorous honesty on our, ourselves. So I want to just reflect on a failure of mine to just make the example that comes out of what... Uh, Werner presented. So I'm on a little inflatable boat in 2011 going to occupy an oil rig in Greenland. And my two colleagues on, uh, in the inflatable with me can see that I am shit scared because I don't swim. And I was hoping their life jacket will keep me going. And, and then they said, uh, no, don't worry, Kumi, if you fall in the ocean, it will take at least two hours before, you know, no, no, before you'll, you'll, you'll die of hypothermia, right? Because what you're wearing has some protective capability. Then I looked at the size of the waves and I thought, shit, it might take two hours for them to actually find me. And then I had this horrible thought that if this was the last protest action for justice that I was going to be engaged in, that 99.99% .99 of my friends, family, and comrades back home in Africa wouldn't have a clue 
what the banner was saying. The banner simply said, stop Arctic destruction. And at that time, this was the first, one of the first big global campaigns to get people to understand that the Arctic is a refrigerator and an air conditioner for the planet. When the sea ice is not there in the summer month, it's not able to reflect the ash rays away and so on, right? So anyway, we do the action, end up in prison for a week in Greenland, get back home as you do, and then go back to South Africa for a holiday period. And one of my cousin's daughter who understands environmental stuff says to me, Uncle Kumi, what a stupid slogan. Stop Arctic destruction. What did that mean to anybody? I said, okay, darling, what would be a better, better slogan? And she said, okay, for starters, I haven't thought about it much, but for starters, I tell you, this would be a much better slogan than stop Arctic destruction. Nobody knew what you were talking about was save Santa Claus now. <laughs> Thank you. But think about what she was saying. She's saying, you activists, you project your consciousness on us, right? You are talking about Arctic destruction. People don't know which part of the world you're talking about, right? You all need to humble yourself, understand where the people are, and meet the people where they are. And if the only association people have with the Arctic is that Santa Claus chills out there for most of the year and comes on his uh, sleigh uh, with the reindeers, I think, uh, whenever. <laughs> Once, right, but he said chilly, he's building toys. Yeah, he's, okay, sorry, he's pulling toys in the cold. But uh, by the way, I told the story to a German parliamentary breakfast after the parliament just got, you know, the new parliament in, in 2021, 20, I guess. Yeah. And at the end of it, a very earnest, well-meaning German parliamentarian came up to me and said, Kumi, that was a really great story. I, I, I just want to make sure you do know Santa Claus doesn't exist, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so with that, we wanted to bring another voice yeah. into the conversation via video. And I want to ask Molly to... Introduce that. So we're building a museum, but the last thing the world needs right now, given the scope, is a museum about, rather than we're the for the United Nations, but about the United Nations in Copenhagen, where I live. So instead of building a museum, we decided to host conversation portals in other um, areas around the world, because we think even more so than action, what we need is to renew a sense of empathy between us and to recreate a sense that we're all in this together. There's a sense of we, there's togetherness that you can't. I do binge watch a lot of shows in my bed by myself at night because I have three kids and I'm exhausted. But the change happens when we're in rooms together with people. So now in these, in these portals, we call them in museums and shopping centers and scientific research institutions and all sorts of places all over the world in Santos, Brazil, and also in Kigali. Um, we have, we're hosting people and we're bringing them in, working with the Center for Constructive Communication at, um, at MIT for how to host conversations that bring people closer to understanding each other. Because if there's one thing we need, in addition to imagination, it's an ability to have empathy with Santa Claus, right? Um, so Carla is going to come from us. We wanted to do this live, but we weren't sure about the connection. So she's, she pre-recorded this, but she's watching right now. Um, Carla is a psychologist in Mexico City in Deyefe. She is Car um, Carla Montoya. She is a psychologist and environmental activist, is a facilitator with the museum and is hosting conversations. And she wanted to send a message to all of us and engage in a conversation because this isn't and shouldn't be a place where we all talk to the same people over and over again at every single conference that we all show up to. We need to welcome in the quietest voices we need to understand which voices are not yet included in the discourse, and we need to level the playing field and tell a counter-narrative about who holds power. Because people who aren't at these tables hold a hell of a lot of more resilience than we often think about and give them credit for. So Carla is one of 25 locations and hopefully growing, um, and maybe we can listen to her and learn something. Hi, my name is Carla Morales. I'm 26 years old. I'm from Mexico City, and I'm a psychologist, researcher, environmental activist, and the founder and director of Ecolicenses Collective. And I want to share with you my perspective into why are arts and culture important in the climate issue. I think that they're very important, and I'm going to share why. 
Uh, in my latest research, I was looking for an answer to the question, why are people not engaging into the climate fight, especially young people? And I found that our brain has two different uh, natural responses to fear. The first one is that when we perceive the threat as something uh, that we can actually fight, then our natural response is to fight it. But when we perceive that the threat is so big that we cannot do anything about it, our natural brain response is to freeze. So uh, nowadays we're only hearing bad news and statistics and these types of messages that don't allow us to do anything. It only makes us freeze. So this is where I found it so important to have arts and culture in the conversation because it really helps to communicate the message in a different way in a way that instead of just making us freeze, actually can make us act or inspire us. And I actually have an experience with this. Uh, one time that I, as an activist, um, I was not feeling quite hopeful around activism. And then I saw a documentary that's called Flow of Change and it's about black voices against climate change. And it really makes me feel so inspired to act because uh, they, I, I think that they actually don't speak a lot in the documentary, but the way that it's that it's there. I don't know, it, it really makes me feel inspired. So I want to ask, ask the panelists over here, uh, how do you think that we can engage people, especially young people to fight and to inspire them instead of making them freeze? Oops, sorry. So, Edgar, welcome my brother. So Edgar's joining us from Brazil. And he's a genius, is all I'm going to say. And he's going to do things with us towards the end that will take you to a different level of participation and finding yourself. So, sorry to, to set you up like that so much. <laughs> uh, so, to the question that was just posed, right? I'd like to see, Hope, would you like to respond to Carla's question? Or Edgar, to bring you in, since you... Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I've been working or blurking, as my friends say, playing, working, uh, exactly in that, how can we invite young people that way, and uh, how to invite the best, best energies. So for me, it's to, uh, to play a journey, epic journey. So every young people, they are ask, uh, looking for uh, young people from any age, right? We are looking for uh, something exciting. We, were, we wanted to serve community, but usually young people, they say like they are not citizens yet. So you're growing and then you have to study and then you go there. So basically the way that I love to do is do designing challenges, impossible challenges. For example, planting a forest or, or solving problems in their own neighborhood, but doing in a way that young people love it. They love doing it in a gang, for example, the crowd where they have to play uh, uh, together. And another thing that I used to do today, they, they have to play superheroes. So each one of you, you have superpowers. So what's your, your own superpower? Discover that, talk with your friends. And what pisses you off in your neighborhood? So they want so, so and they know what piss, uh, teenagers they are always looking for things that are wrong, right? And <laughs> criticize. And then they go right away, say this, 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 we have no forest, we have no place for, for kids, uh, uh, elders are not being taken care. And then they say, okay, now you have three weeks to solve it. And you're not allowed to use money. So basically the challenge, so we design challenge that has to be fast, free, fun, and fantastic. I should answer that. So, it has to be fast, free, fun, and fantastic. They go from there. So if you design, if you design the challenges, the problems, the issues. So teenagers didn't want to talk about issues, you know. But if you raise it as a challenge, you know, an epic journey, they are in. Like say, okay, okay, okay. And if you frame it as a game, that they're gonna meet more each other, they have to find resources in their own neighborhoods, and then say like you're not allowed to use money. Then they, they bring. The, no, it's the challenge. And because they are together, they figure out a way. And we always challenge them to mobilize their own neighborhood as well. It's not just you, youth, young people, they're going to do that. But you have to mobilize your whole neighborhood to support you. So it's your thing. But how are you going to do that? You got, I don't care. You go, dip, 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 and they find a way. And they do it. So it's just how to frame, to save the biosphere into something like the more close to them. Wonderful. Yeah. We're going to come to the audience. Over to you on the end. Today? Yes. So they kept talking about hope, hope, the word. And I just wanted to make, pay attention to the power of words as well. Uh, words are weapons and we use words a lot and we become what we are because of the words we use. So 
my mother named me Hope because she was in a, actually it was my father, they were in a hopeless situation. I was born and raised as a refugee. So a lot of refugee kids go to these names, Hope, Peace, Faith, jo everything they never had, they named it to their children. And we, we grew up like that. I became, I grew up knowing that regardless of whatever storms I'm in, there's always a better situation. If I have the will to carve yeah. that situation, uh, if I have, if I'm in the darkness, I have the, the end, I, I, and I have the will to carve light of a dark situation, I'll carve light out of darkness. If, if I'm in a situation where I really can't laugh or smile, I have the ability as a person and it takes courage and resilience to carve happiness, even in a situation where there's no joy. So that's what for me art has become. Uh, growing up in a family of 11 kids, and I'm the only artist and the rest are scientists and uh, three girls and I'm the 10th born. So they just woke up one morning and Hope was an artist. And why? Because it helped me be. It helped me play. I kept playing and without that spirit of a child of playfulness within, we cannot innovate. And sometimes we block this because of our, our culture, our situations. We are just thinking, oh, art is structured. It's like this, it's like that. But what I've discovered living in Rwanda now for the last 23 years where I migrated back to my country, I've been using art to create safe spaces, to breathe and be. But I found that art is a masterpiece. Art can kill or it can make. Because in the Rwandan genocide, art was used to kill, yeah. to incite violence. Very catchy, nice music. If you don't know the language, you find yourself dancing to this song saying, kill them cockroaches. And it's very nice. But because you don't know the language, you're, being, you're participating in this, in this thing. So I returned to my country using art as a weapon of peace to invite everyone. I'm like, you know, regardless whether you're what or what, or I'm this or I'm that, I'm that, at the end of the day, we all need to breathe, we need to laugh. We need, what we share in common is what is left. So I want art to be a power, a, a force of power that helps us be resilient, be, be courageous to face harsh truth so we can repair things that we've broken, so we can repair the, the tomorrow we want. I have found this to be the most powerful space for me to become the hope I am, regardless of what is going on in my life. Art helps me open that space and create that space and shift to a place I call home. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, Edgar. Maybe it's just one, one sentence. I think it's so important and you hear it now in the pen and that's for me at least very important. I don't know how you feel. Anyway, we go to you now. It's also that we're talking about popular culture and let's say mass culture, but at the same time, we're talking about the very important community work, the very individual work. And I think both is important in my view. It's not like just only the big thing. We are, and that's why I think we also have to start with ourselves. Thank you, Hope, for, for bringing that in. And also thanks, thanks to you to bring that in, yeah, saying it's uh, this community wanted, challenge. Yeah, just want to add, because I think you said something that it starts with us. We are so indebted and on pressure to do something, to look like we are doing something, it's like we are reporting to something. Social media is doing this. What are, are you relevant? Are you still relevant? Are you doing something? <laughs> but if you're not relevant to yourself, how would you be relevant to your community? And I think we need to do a self-investigation or a, an introspect, take an introspective journey within. Because if we are empty of peace, we will not give peace. If we are empty of love, we will not give love. If we are empty of these things we are talking about, we will not be. Able, what are we giving? So I think it's important what you said. We begin with ourselves, and that's where change starts with an individual. But we are under pressure to look like we are doing something. Thank you very much. I'm going to come to you in a sec, right, for comments or uh, questions. I feel free to do both, but I thought I'll just quickly lift one thing that comes from all of us here, right? One of the things we're saying is, let's not sanitize the fact that we are in a deep crisis as humanity, one. Two we're saying is, let's embrace the power of arts and culture to enable us to communicate impactfully, fast, on scale, that reaches the people that absolutely need to be part of this conversation and this game, rather than being standing on the sidelines watching the game, right? And what we're also saying, I think, is 
history of political mobilization, when you look at it, especially at community level, grassroots level, tells you that people are most encouraged to participate is if there's joy, arts, culture being respected, right? And I just want to end by saying that when our Secretary General of Amnesty, we gave the Ambassador of Conscience Award to Greta Thunberg and Fridays for the Future. And I tell you, I was with them quite a bit during that, that period. And, and one of the things that was just breaking my heart so much was conversations where young girls were asking me questions like, you know, not asking me questions, but just saying. So like, it really would be irresponsible of us thinking about having kids, right? You know, I mean, you know how many young girls are having those conversations today? Everywhere I go, this conversation comes up, mm -hmm. right? And, and then I just felt this deep sense of tragedy about how young people are losing their innocence and are having to be adults in the same way that some of us had to do in the anti-apartheid struggle. And I know the tragedy of what that meant for young people to lose as one person lost one's childhood. So my message to them was, listen, it's unfair that my generation has failed so badly that your generation has to carry such a heavy load. But please make sure that you are singing, you're dancing, you're having fun while you are prosecuting struggle. Celebrate the relationships with each other. And for all of us, young and old, the coming decades is going to challenge our well-being like never before. Let's just budget for that right now. Let's just budget that our well-being is going to be challenged. And let's start preparing for it. Let's rise above it. Let's do the best we can. And part of it is to make sure, and as I told Greta and the Fridays for the Future, don't let the Trumps and the Bolsonaros and the Orbans and the Modis of the world deprive you of your right to happiness mm -hmm. and to childhood. And try and create a special childhood because you have to do what you're doing, but do it with as much participation, love, arts and culture in it. So sorry if we took a little bit too long. We've got at least half an hour, but the floor is open and you are welcome to uh, make comments, ask questions to the panel as you like. But let me just say that Please try and be brief so we get as many voices in. Sort of similar to the topic you were just mentioning, I, I was uh, in a previous life um, a trade union organiser and an activist, and I burnt out of that experience quite badly and have been in much easier professions um, for the last seven years. And I'm now retraining to go back into um, hopefully a more activist-focused career. And I suppose I wanted to know, for you individually as activists, how do you keep yourself topped up and how do you kind of keep going into the fight when the world does feel a bit... a lot, as <laughs> best I can put that. Thank you. Thanks. What we're going to do is collect a whole bunch of questions. I'll ask the panel to choose whichever questions and then we'll move to our closure. Okay, so let's get in as many questions and comments as you'd like. Oh, there we have one here. Hello. Um, yeah, I guess um, what I was thinking is about something you were saying about the the, the South Af African brainwashing corporation um, and this idea that we you know we have to try and get um, use arts and culture as a medium for propagation uh, and encouragement but how do we do that when we seem to have you know like as you were saying the budgets are being cut BBC is now you know being controlled by the Tory party um, uh, Hollywood is still a, a huge money-making machine. Bollywood's a big money-making machine. Where does the intervention come in and how do you... Um, I mean, one thing I was thinking about is nobody's mentioned things like computer games um, and social media platform gaming, which is so much more prevalent even than... Uh, and, and, but, I mean, I guess the thing is, like, you know, um, how, do, how do we create channels where people who are, who've got ideas to, to change things, to, to nudge to encourage those people, find them, encourage them, and then push 
the things that they're doing up to these enormous levels because it's all very well saying we need to write TV series that are empowering, but who's going to write that? I mean, are, is it going to be indigenous people from rainforest writing TV series? Because do they have access? Do they have other other, other channels there? That's my question, I guess. Great. Molly, you can park that one for you, right? Uh, somebody here, I think, had their hands up. There we go. Hello, my name is Alejandro from Venezuela. And I remember in 2019 talking with uh, Edgar in Mexico. Um, I discovered the, the importance of the culture for my work because we train in Venezuela women and young people in trades, many trades, carpenter, mechanics. But uh, we are living in a humanitarian crisis. And it's not enough food or change the government or have a job. We discovered that the culture is very important for the human being. And I remember that Ed Edgar aimed me to sing <laughs> because I I'm not a singer, but I like to sing. And, and after that, we start a project to, to recover our traditional songs, the people working in farms, and we also produce a, a disc. And right now we are trying to promote also photographs, uh, take photos of the people working in Venezuela in different areas. So I am here because I, I know what to be alone in this kind of initiatives. I, I discovered, listen to you, there is many opportunities and we want to learn more about how to be in front of a humanitarian crisis, but with a happiness and a hope uh, for the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, you can pass it to Thank you. Um, I'm Marie and from Malawi. Um, I'm going to talk about the youth. You brought the youth in. Well, we have a school for 400 orphans. Um, and when I started the school about 20 years ago, I believed that art with these children who most of them were orphaned by AIDS and living with grandparents and uh, went through a really uh, tough experience in their childhood. So uh, growing up, I, we brought in the arts into the school and we noticed that this was literally the answer. Now in Malawi, in schools, uh, we don't, we have expressive arts, but we don't bring in things like, you have the music, the, the uh, poetry, the drama, the, um, the dance, uh, visual arts, uh, all together. And we did this. Um, so, my comment here is, these children today, have become little activists. Because as I'm talking right now, we've had problems in Malawi with road safety. Uh, lots of deaths, we don't have zebra crossings, and these children are at the moment um, putting in, uh, doing murals and expressing the need of uh, the government putting these things on. So here, the youth are literally taking action. We just had um, the Cyclone Freddy. Uh, if you heard about uh, just recently, three weeks ago. And these children themselves were the ones who decided to go into the camps, uh, which are the, uh, the centers where all the uh, people, was, the shelters, and to draw and paint, uh, dance and do music themselves took the initiative to do these things. Now, I had to bring this comment up because I feel that uh, of embracing the youth and listening to the youth um, through education too and through the arts, I think we can see a lot of change Thank that's you. gonna happen uh, in the world. Thank so you very our much. artists start at a very young age all the way to uh, much Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. If there's anybody else. 
three. Just a couple of really quick comments. Um, one is that I think that there is a movement mobilising. So your your points about wanting to be part of this, I think it's everywhere. But what we're not doing very well is witnessing it. We're not celebrating it very well because this is this kind of incredible moment that we're in where people are using these extraordinary instruments of change to do uh, to, to, to actually gather and mobilise, but what we, we're not doing is witnessing it. The second thing, just very quickly to say, is that the other end of it is the fact that the IPCC, uh, e the United Nations, you know, UNESCO have not recognised the role of culture. Anything like enough, the role of cu cu culture in the context of climate, in nature, now that incredibly difficult uh, issue, and justice. And it's just worth um, saying, and B.D. Finzi, who's, who's part of this as well, was that at the COP27 talks, for the very, very first time, uh, cultural heritage has been recognized in the cover decision, the Sharm el Sheikh cover, cover decision. And for the next COP, uh, there will be much more about culture. We're trying to get it as a thematic all the way through. This is really important because it affects policy. And policy are the frameworks that we all need much more to, to bring culture up as this extraordinary instrument of change that is happening and that we really need to, to, to valorize in a different way. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, my name is Awanja. I'm from Kenya. And uh, my so it's a question is partly also just thinking out loud. Um, this question of access, because there's so many barriers in so many places. Um, an event such as this one, access for the people that we are talking about, the people that we need to start seeing in these rooms, the people that you were mentioning that we need to start seeing in these panels and the conversations and perspectives that we need to start hearing, the mobilization that you're talking about for this de decade. Access for a lot of those people is a problem, whether it's to resources, whether it's how they, where they're going to be seen. And so I'm just curious on not just for you, but for all of us at an individual level, how we think about these things, about reducing access and reducing barriers. I'll tell you very quickly. For most of our communities, and you know, Hope, um, art, for example, even museums, we don't have a culture of taking artifacts to a place to go see them. They are in our cookware, they are on our walls. It's the way we, what we wear, our jewelry, it's art every day. It's embedded in our spirituality and in our lives. And so where then do you capture that? How do we start reimagining how different people speak, live, experience art, and use that, leverage that to drive this message of hope, this message of climate, in mobilizing action, public action that's going to hold power to, um, to account. So I think my question is embedded in those, in those kinds of thoughts of barriers and access and reimagining what um, interaction interpretation of art looks like. Great, thank you so much. There's last two questions, one year and one year. Please keep it brief if you can, thank you. Um, it's really wonderful that you said what you said and this follows on because it's something that was in my head. And it was when you said we need to budget for our well-being being affected in the future. And I think I, I work in accessibility and equality, um, diversity and inclusion, is what we call it in the UK. Um, and the Museums Association has just done a new ethic code of conduct. So I was thinking about Mo Molly, um, including more disabled people's um, voices within within these kind of discussions. And I think I, I just have a, my seed of hope <laughs> is that within the communities that have been pushed to the edge, that are excluded, that aren't included often in these conversations, are completely different ways of doing things that can actually be accelerators to some of these ideas, particularly in the disabled community. When we're thinking about budgeting for our well-being in the future, if you go and work with people whose well-being has been, well, they've not had access to it. They might not even, you know, well-being is a sort of very Western-centric kind of word in the first place, might not even have a direct translation in certain countries. So, um, oh, I realised I made a statement rather than a question, which definitely wasn't my intention. But yeah, just um, if right. maybe Molly could speak to kind of what's happening um, around that kind Thank of thing you. with the, yeah, with her work. Thank you very much. And the last question goes to Rosemary Preston. Oh, okay, I will squeeze you in. Uh, as well. Um, we've heard about 
how resources for adult learning are scant. Historically, the first time, for as soon as you're in a political economic crisis, what gets cut? It's formalized adult education from Japan to Africa to Latin America and F knows where. And it's absolutely appalling. I did a big study at the end of the war in Namibia, independence from South Africa. And I want to just raise a couple of points from that. I was so impressed at a guy who was, I think his name was Steve, I can't remember his other name, but Kumi might know him. Um, this guy had been detained by the liberation movement within them. And eventually he had mobilized in the camp among the detainees, adult learning groups. And they were then reflecting on their reality of their situation. They'd been freedom fighters and so forth. And how they use their knowledge, both of that turn of events and their own experience to how they should use it afterwards to inform people. And in the same environment, I think I learned then because it was so powerful coming across people who'd been 18, 20 years in Robin Island and getting to know them really well. And you, there was such an internal depth and profound silence in these people who had been released, were living lives, were building lives back in, in this case, Namibia, but the same in South Africa. Um, and their knowledge was so profound, but not ever vaunted with pride. And what they've achieved by way of writing, organization, participatory accents, it's very powerful. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Can you pass it there very, very quickly? We are out of time. And I'm hoping all of you can stay for at least 10 minutes so we can wrap it up. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, just building on the conversation here, I think my first question is about philanthropic funding and investment. We discussed about the uh, thing being, art being a luxury. And so my question being, how can we, uh, if that's the case, if that's a challenge, or are there some challenges that we haven't talked about? If, if that's the case, what are the challenges and what can we do about it? That's the first question. Second one, I was just thinking about uh, Molly's discussion on culture and how powerful it is and that we have to reimagine. And um, I was thinking about who, who was reimagining this? Who has the power for it? And just to give a context, I, I'm from India and there was a recently um, launched state of the art cultural center by Nita Mukesh Ambani. Um, so th the case being that th there are a lot of these institutions that are created by the most richest and powerful. How can we even out the spaces and make sure that we get access to all, ensuring democracy in these spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you each and every one of you asked a question. Sorry if you didn't get a chance to ask, but uh, all of us, all five of us are gonna be here for the next four days. Please reach out to us. What we'll do now is give some quick responses from each of the panelists, and then we'll hand it over to Edgar to captivate you to end the day, okay? So only short, I mean, we, I cannot cover everything, but I think what uh, to, to you, what you said in Venezuela, I think it's a little bit insane. And that's a tricky thing about the Maslow pyramid that we think that self-actualization is only for those who really deserve it. And we talk a lot about dignity and what is included in dignity. And obviously arts and creation and innovation and being curious and joy, these are basic vitalities we all need. If we don't get them, we suffer and we are getting sick. And I think that that's what we have to say. Beauty is, is an important ingredient, especially in times of crisis for all of us for all of us. Um, and, and to the topic of access, it's, it's so interesting what you're saying. It's so true. You know, we created these temples of arts, even in contemporary dance where I've been, you know, it's a bubble. We have to be fair. Now, it's interesting that the opera didn't start in these beautiful houses. It started uh, on the marketplaces, even here in Europe. People don't know. The, the opera director doesn't even know in Vienna. I asked him, where does it start? You know, and, and very often I say the doors in your big houses, they're not here, the people come in, you should go out. We have to go out. We have, and, and that's also a little bit to your question, how do we, how do we um, convince also philanthropists to invest into art? 
that we combine it, that we see it as a, a cross-cutting instrument, being part of everything, being part of daily practices rather than just being that luxury thing for the few who can afford. And I think this is a different way of seeing uh, the arts and that can be high quality you know and that discussion is insane this is high quality and that one in the marketplace or that one on a daily basis on a square is not high quality it's all about energy at the end of the day so i'm i'm and that's what we try to do to infuse it to infuse it in all the different realms not keep it in that bubble if i'm only um, fighting for that bubble i will fail we have to infuse it into education as you just mentioned into well-being although we can talk a lot about that term, into climate realm in those. So really it's about mainstreaming because it's our basic human language. It's a language and we have to learn it. And that means access from the very beginning, as you said it, from the very, very beginning. It's not, it's maybe the most important language. Thank you very much, Verna. Wally? Um, yeah, I, I think just to really quickly piggyback on that, I think um, cultural institutions in terms of access and inclusion need to really rethink the the um the privilege they've inherited and that the fact that they're not le leveraging the fact that they are some of the most trusted institutions that remain in society and yet they're not stepping into advocacy so we're trying to model a different type of cultural institution that doesn't ask people to come up to stairs and and be enlightened but actually goes out into communities that do not have necessarily cultural institutions although i'm a big fan of the national museum of kenya and other other museums in nairobi um and and deliberately welcome in voices that are never asked to come to these sorts of fora and ask them to be part of the conversations, record those conversations, analyze them using AI, hold them in posterity. That's the collection we're building as a museum or the conversations that we engender in this most critical decade of humanity so that we can then analyze it and use it and make it free and accessible. And it's the people who are living in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh, in refugee camps in Uganda, in places in Rabiel, Iraq, Who's, who have the most knowledge to share about living with adversity, about taking care of well-being in, in adversity. And we need to honor that, and we are learning a lot about that. So uh, welcome to that. I, the one thing I would say about pop culture versus um, grassroots culture is I think there's often a delineation that's really unfair there, that, that a lot of artists that I've met in pop culture consider themselves artists, right, first and foremost. They're not just businesses, right? Billie Eilish isn't just a business. At first, she probably started singing in her in her bedroom, um, probably better than you. But um, but but who knows, right? Who um, knows? Who knows? Who knows? Well, what I would say is that organizations like the largest streaming service in the world, right? Like huge gaming platforms, Minecraft, for example, um, like Netflix, like um, Disney Hotstar, where we're going to be putting uh, Jess and I and other other groups together, our first Bollywood production. They're not just corporations. They're also run by human beings. And as Catherine Hayhoe says, everyone's a climate activist. Everyone, they, sometimes people just don't know it yet. People are coming to us now. Large businesses are coming to us. Sometimes maybe because they know if they don't do something, they're going to be called out on it. And they're going to therefore lose subscribers. And it's better to retain customers than try to, to try to acquire them, right? So there's a business incentive for doing the right thing. But there's also a human incentive for doing the right thing. So we're starting to see large scale actors in the mass culture sector come to us and say, we know we have a platform. We don't know how to use it. Can we work together? And there's artistic integrity. So the biggest writers in Bollywood, the one, one of the writers um, for Dangle, is writing a new climate thriller together with us. Um, and that film was is the largest grossing film in the history of the world. It was downloaded 400 million times in China alone, right? So how do you take that kind of, of star power? He's working with scientists and saying the science of climate is crazier than any fiction I could imagine and embedding it within a, a thriller, not a documentary, because it has to be more cookie than spinach if you're going to keep hitting the button to get to the next thing. Um, but I think it's really important that we all ask ourselves on a constant basis, whose voices are missing, and what do I do deliberately to include those voices? Um, and we're trying to model that in, in our organization quite humbly as a new startup. Um, and we see it being modeled by a lot of other organizations as well. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Edgar to bring us to a close. But before I do that, I just want to quickly say that this conversation is a reminder to us that the struggle for justice has always been a marathon and not a sprint, right? And that one thing that has to change moving forward 
is activism and philanthropy as well, having much greater humility than we have had in the past. That I have led organizations where often I was in a position where I had to stand on a platform and say, we know that this is what's going to happen and so on. Right? But right, what we need right now is also an approach of what we have been calling a culture of emergence, right? where we say, we know that we need to reduce emissions, we know we have to in, increase uh, gender equality, economic equality and so on. But unless we frame the task of addressing those things in a spirit of openness and co-creation, where we invite people to come in with the solutions, we are not going to muster the scale of mobilization that we need. So, on behalf of all of us that have been working together for quite some time now, at least for about a year and a half, we want to say to you that there's going to be efforts that we are doing already. To our friend there, Mine, uh, UN Live is already working with Minecraft to try to push them not to only have games which are about shooting and crashing cars, but also about building... That's not Minecraft. That's sorry. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, well. That's okay. Oh, okay, sorry, no, no, sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. okay. Actually, Pardon my point. ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you got the point. <laughs> so. Never played Minecraft. <laughs> no, not yet. Uh, so, so, so basically, the idea is to meet people where they are, right? And we're not saying it's easy, but we're saying it does require a shift where we invest seriously in this. We retool ourselves, we open up ourselves to say we all need to learn new things and we are consciously saying how do we get the largest number of people to participate in the fight for their lives. Okay, so with that, thank you once again and I want to hand you over to Edgar uh, who will bring us to a close and remind us as Hope did right at the beginning the power of connecting with each other as human beings and celebrating each other is critically what we're going to need to move forward and meet the challenges that lay ahead of us. Over to you, Edgar. <laughs> Thank you, Kumi. While you were sharing, I was thinking about, okay, I can answer some of the questions by not by speaking, but by acting altogether. And so I'll probably be there, so many of the, uh, the answers. And that Two things, that, actually three quotes that came to me that can uh, be present, uh, present in, this, in this closing. There's one is an African quote. I heard in South Africa, but I don't know if, it's, if, if, if it was born in South Africa. And they say, uh, no matter the question, answer is community. No matter the question or the challenge, answer is community. And I really love it. So you're gonna be, you'll be present in our closing. The second one, it was from kids in, in, a, in a slum in Brazil, from Brazil. And after playing our games, or playing the community games, they say something like that, but reframing different ways to say, like, what if building the world, because, all, because of the game, all of the games about building what they, they are missing, they, their own community, right? And they say, what if building the world of our dreams, our dreams could be fast, free, fun, and fantastic? So was, they were inviting us for a, a different narrative. So Yuval Harari is saying, like, what, what are the stories? So we need a new story. What are the stories that we're tell, telling ourselves and telling others that can activate? It's a Santa Claus saving or Arctic saving. So depending on the story that you're inviting, community can join you in a certain quality or not. Right? So I love those ones. And that's why I'm going to invite you for this last movement together. And it would be like three Three phases. One is prepare. Second one is igniting. igniting. And the third one is repair. It's very important to repair, right? So prepare, igniting, and repair. We're going to do it in five minutes, most, so we can, we can leave. So the first one, the first challenge for all of us, not a panel here, but we all as a panel, and I will challenge all of us in to prepare the field for igniting. So basically, we have, we have to do this, this prepare in silence. You can communicate with each other, but not using words. What you have to do in two minutes, two minutes, 
is to clean up the whole room. Okay, all the tables, you can place the tables there, in the corner, even here, but you have to have a full, whole place here. Two minutes, bring it all up, and creating two circles here, one inside the other. Are you ready? Go, silence.